Joining me now, attorney and former FBI special agent Catherine Schweit, author of Stop the Killing, How to End the Mass Shooting Epidemic, and James Densley, professor at the School of Law Enforcement and Criminal Justice at Metro State University. He is co-author of The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic. So to both of you, Catherine, to you first, how do you answer the question of, of your book title? How do you stop these mass shootings? Well, it takes a lot of awareness on the part of the people around us. You know, I think a lot of times we, in the early days, thought maybe law enforcement was the answer, but law enforcement can't be the answer. It has to be the people who are around, the people who see the notes in the pocket, the parents who see their kids uh, doing things, the adults, the partners uh, and spouses. That, I mean, that's really the answer. I'm a Spartan myself, so getting that call last night was really difficult to, it was, it was quite a struggle to hear that this was underway. And, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm with the community there. I look at the images of the buildings that I walked into, and now I'm seeing law enforcement walk into those. It's really difficult. Of course, it, it, and it must have been horrendous, Catherine, for the parents as well for several hours, at least four hours that I can think of, where they were, there was a search, of course, for him. And we heard eyewitness accounts of students jumping through windows. I mean, the terror that they were feeling. Catherine, uh, speak to that. I think that the challenge, right, is, is that what we have is a big, wide open area, and it's never going to be a lockdown area. So this everybody is going to be panicked, and the parents who aren't anywhere near their kids, they're even worse. I was on the, uh, on the university's Facebook page responding, uh, not as the university person, but responding as like the parents and other alumni saying, hey, you know, be patient, law enforcement, and knows how to do this. I think Michigan State did an excellent job last night, textbook job. The Michigan State Police and the law enforcement officers who responded on how to keep people safe on that campus. And when they did get an image of their suspect, they put it out right away. Law enforcement was able to find the suspect right away. So they did everything they could possibly do once things started to go bad. So in order to stop the killing, we need to find a way to catch the shooters before. And in order to do that, it's really going to take citizens who pay attention to what's going on around them and report what they see. See something, say something. And James Densley, NBC News is reporting that the gunman turned, quote, evil and mean, according to some reports apparently, after his mother's death, according to his father. Can you speak to that, um, to how one person's pain can then lead to such evil behavior affecting a whole community? Sure. First, I want to uplift the, the Michigan State community. I've got family members who are graduates of Michigan State. I've got colleagues who uh, are em employees at Michigan State, and, and so my heart goes out to them today. Uh, with regard to this, in our research, we often see that mass shootings are a form of suicide, and they are driven by despair. And so we have somebody here who has died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound after perpetrating yet another mass shooting. and so. It's quite a common narrative that we hear that people are turning their internal angers and frustrations outward, and it's a public spectacle intended to send a message to the world. But I think what really needs to be highlighted here is that we are in a perpetual cycle of mass shootings, and every single one of these shootings is lowering the threshold for the next one because others are watching and they're seeing this as just a normalized form of behavior in our society and it's unacceptable. And what we are doing to an entire generation of young people every time these events occur, you just heard somebody survived the Michigan uh, high school shooting and then goes to Michigan State and survives another mass shooting within what, 18 months of each other? It's, it's ridiculous. We have to do something about this, and we have to do something about it very quickly, because it's becoming a routine, and if we don't break that routine, it's just going to keep happening. And Catherine, I, I agree with you that in watching it in real time, they flooded the zone with all sorts of law enforcement from surrounding communities. They were there in minutes. One thing does occur, these, both of these buildings were open. I know university campuses where you have to have a key card uh, at all hours to get in or out of a building. Is that a solution where these buildings should be better protected against outsiders? 
No, I, I don't think it is because, you know, you, you're talking about locking doors. And in fact, Berkey was scheduled to be locked at a certain point in time, but we have public spaces. It's, it's a, it's, we're not going to be able to lock every door in every community, in every neighborhood, lock every library door, and you have to get into a key card, lock every school, lock every uh, church and synagogue. It's more important that we find a way to find the shooters than it is to ag add magnetometers. And there's not to say secure doors doors aren't important, but but schools are, are open campuses and people walk through cafeterias and libraries all the time and kids, you know, study, get to the library at 2 a.m. to start their studying. So it's more important that we think about it that way. You know, and I didn't want today to go by without remembering that 15 years ago, seven people lost their lives and 17 were injured at Northern Illinois University's shooting 15 years ago today. Thank you so much, James Densley, Catherine Schweit. Thanks to you and to the whole Michigan State University community, Catherine, uh, you and your colleagues and your fellow alums, we're so sorry.